Let's cross now to Brussels to listen to what Charles Michel is telling reporters. Discuss strategy to prepare the next major meeting, and that will be with the ASEAN countries here in Brussels in December. First element, we have uh, taken stock of the fact that the Chinese political system does not operate on the long the same rules as we do. Uh, we consider that we are a democracy and that is a very pivotal uh, issue. We have human rights, personal rights, freedoms, uh, whereas uh, in China the point of departure is that the state and indeed the party is the determining criterion. So you are operating with a very different matrix, a very different political system. Uh, this is an objective, uh, neutral um, way of ascertaining the facts. We have looked at our various levers, though. We have to be strong and upright and defend the principles that we believe in strongly, fundamental rights and fundamental freedoms. We are committed to uh, introducing more reciprocity in our economic relations with China and Europe. This is work that will have to be done across the board in all topics and it is with, it's closely connected to engaging with China on other subjects, uh, climate change, which is a very obvious topic. We want to engage with China. So this discussion showed a very clear will to avoid being naive, but neither did we want to embark uh, in systematic confrontation. We have our own model to develop, to build, to uh, model and form our relations with China. We have to ensure that we can uh, respond to the way that our program is organized and has been some time now. There's great consensus and convergence amongst the European leaders on the importance, the importance of truly developing strategic autonomy, the capacity to be less dependent in strategic terms, to increase our independence in strategic terms, but also as part of that to reinforce and diversify our partnerships with the rest of the world. Uh, we had a summit in February uh, in Brussels with African countries and partners, which was an opportunity to build the foundations for a new relationship, a uh, new mutual relationship, partner to partner across Africa. Uh, we wanted to ensure that we, the leaders, can deliver on our promises. We don't want to uh, bring about any disillusionment. There are expectations, so we have to assess the promises we make, how they are implemented, and how they are being brought about. This is a very strong tool, and it's something that needs regular and political assessment to ensure that the objectives that we've set ourselves are met and that our partners do gain added value from their relations with the European Union. Latin America, I'm sure you will be aware, next year under the Spanish presidency there will be a summit in Brussels uh, with Latin American countries and we are preparing this summit. There's also the Indo-Pacific Indo region and ASEAN will have the meeting here in Brussels in December. We need to engage with the rest of the world, diversify our partnerships, build strategies to ensure that that we are more independent. And then this is a link to a very dense uh, discussion that we had uh, in a few hours. It reflects what we discussed in March in Versailles. This was on the strategies of the European Union. We considered that there were three key pillars that we had to work on in order to reinforce our capacity to influence, to defend our interests and promote our values. The first pillar is energy. We said an awful lot about that recently, so we continue to be extremely committed to building our autonomy and 
sovereignty in this area because when we are very dependent, there are costs, there is a price, and there are difficulties in energy dependency. So we are trying to deal with that issue. The second element, security and defense. This is a key moment to reinforce European defense, increase cooperation amongst ourselves to decrease dependence there. And this is in very close cooperation with NATO, and we are actively working on declarations uh, on the part of NATO and the EU. And then technological leadership. We want to look at technologies for the future, too. There are stakes that are also uh, touched upon by the previous topics. We have strengths, we have weaknesses, and we have to ensure that in terms of technological dependence, uh, we have the uh, CHIPS Act and other acts which seek to mobilize the resources that we have at our disposal, and we have to encourage innovation, technological development, and be ambitious in this area. These are a few elements, a few of the lines of thought that show the very density of discussions and the fact that it was all directly linked to very topical current issues. We are in a phase of geopolitical transition, and it's important that in Europe we have clear ideas that we act in concert, and that that is perhaps the best summary of the very spirit of our discussions uh, at this UCO and foreign affairs. And then on to Iran. We have a reference to this in the conclusions. It illustrates our values, protection of women. This is very clear. Sanctions have been taken against those who are participating in the repression of uh, peaceful demonstrations. And this is, of course, linked to uh, their support of Russia against Ukraine. So, again, there were in-depth discussions there. We looked at the situation in Ukraine and interventions. Uh, we had a virtual intervention from uh, President Zelensky, and we have looked at our support for Ukraine. There's a lot of support for it, military, financial, humanitarian, and political, and we have to put pressure against the offending regime, and we also have to look at the freezing of assets, assets that have been seized and their use for reconstruction and support of Ukraine. There will be a conference there. Uh, the Commission and the World Food Programme are involved in this, so the international community is involved in coordination, uh, very strong coordination in the short term to uh, preserve Ukraine, and we have to bear in mind this major act a few weeks ago where we granted Ukraine candidate status, which is something that is very important. So we also need to act to ensure that this is a credible and strong perspective for Ukraine. So we've been working on this very directly. So it was a very fruitful UCO. They worked within a reasonable time frame on very difficult subjects. And this has certainly demonstrated that we have this conviction that when we meet together, we can increase our influence and have genuine constructive impact. And it's not done yet. We have work to do, and this lies ahead of us. And this uh, summit should give us confidence for the work that we have to do in the months to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, we had a very good discussion this morning, again, after having yesterday agreed on this huge energy package. Uh, there is a lot of work now ahead of us where the energy is concerned, but the roadmap is very clear, and uh, it was good to have this unanimity, this broad support for the roadmap that we have put forward. Today, the focus was indeed on the two topics, Ukraine and China. And here, um, looking at Ukraine, let me uh, first of all uh, focus on the financing of Ukraine. Um, as you know, we had agreed to have $9 billion of macrofinancial assistance to Ukraine, which will be partially uh, dispersed till the end of the year. Overall, so far, the European Union, the European level, have uh, supported Ukraine since the beginning of the year with, uh, with by now, 19 billion euros. 
but the focus was in the discussion more now of the, on uh, the year to come. It is very important for Ukraine to have a predictable and stable flow of income, um, and therefore we, um, we assume and uh, we, we, the Ukraine is telling us that they need approximately three to four billion euros per month um, to, have for the, to, to have enough resources for the basics. And these three to four billion um, euros should be um, financed by the European Union, by our American friends and by the financial institutions. Therefore, the discussion was about round about 1.5 billion per month for Ukraine financed by the European Union. So this would give overall a figure of 18 billion for the next year, an amount where then Ukraine can count on and where there's a stable and reliable, predictable flow of income. We have tasked the finance ministers to develop the appropriate me mechanism, but it was important also to give this signal to Ukraine that we very well know how important this reliable flow of income is. Of course, there are other topics on the agenda. Um, having seen in the last days the atrocious and deliberate attacks uh, of Russia against civilian infrastructure, um, Ukraine has other needs that have to be addressed, for example, the mobilization of uh, humanitarian aid to help the most vulnerable in Ukraine to get through this winter. In particular, the more than 11 million internally displaced people by now who need support, who need access to water, electricity, heating, who need shelter. Uh, we have announced this week that we will provide a further 175 million euros for food, for shelter, for health support and for education, and we will provide emergency shelters in the Rivna, Bucha and Kharkiv regions. Of course, we are um, in very close contact now with the Ukrainian uh, authorities um, to look at how we can restore as best and as much as possible electricity, water supply and other essential services like, for example, heating. For that purpose, Commissioner Lenacic was on site this week to assess the situation, to activate the civil protection mechanism and to look at how best and quickly we can support Ukraine to deal with these vicious and atrocious attacks on the civilian infrastructure. This is the immediate support, but of course there is also the mid- and long-term support for reconstruction and indeed Next week, we will have, in the context of the German G7 presidency, co-hosted by the Chancellor and me, a conference on the reconstruction of Ukraine. This is a conference that looks at the how should we address uh, the reconstruction. It is a huge task. It is an international conference. The best experts uh, worldwide uh, are, will come, will join, and uh, discuss how to best approach technically um, but also financial, financially um, this reconstruction uh, process together not only with the European Union but also with our global partners um, and of course the reconstruction process and the massive uh, investments that are necessary should be aligned with uh, the needs for reform in order to really pave already the path to EU membership uh, Ukraine, as you know, is a candidate country, so everything should be um, focused on uh, this common journey that we will uh, undertake together. The second topic was indeed China. And yes, the discussion showed that we are witnessing, witnessing quite an acceleration of trends and tensions. Um, it was very clear from uh, the Congress that we've seen um, that President Xi is continuing to reinforcing the very assertive and self-reliant course China has taken. And clearly China is continuing a mission to establish its dominance in East Asia and its influence globally. And at the same time, we have been witnessing, you will recall that in February, uh, the so-called agreement on no limits partnership between Russia and China right before the invasion in Ukraine. So these developments will affect the EU-China relationship. 
The Chinese system is fundamentally different from ours, and we are aware of the nature of the rivalry. And against this backdrop, we had a very good strategic discussion on our relationship uh, with China. Obviously, we have to be very vigilant when it comes to dependencies, and we've learned our lesson what the overdependency on fossil fuels from Russia is concerned and how tough but necessary it is to get rid of this dependency. In the case of China, it is the risk of dependency on technologies and raw materials, and therefore the priorities here are to reinforce our own capacities and, of course, also to diversify the supply of raw materials towards reliable, trustworthy suppliers. In this context, um, the CHIPS Act concerning semiconductors, so technologies, and the Critical Raw Materials Act are the major initiatives um, that we have put on the table. They are basically the strategic response to our dependencies. But so are also the free trade agreements and raw material partnerships that we are working on with other countries, in other words, with reliable partners. The recent foreign direct investment screening is also a, a strong tool that has been given to us. So with our new instruments, like the International Procurement Instrument and the Regulation on Foreign Subsidies, we will uh, have a new foundation how to approach China those two, the International Procurement Instrument and uh, the foreign subsidies, these regulations will enter into force in spring next year. This shows there is a broad uh, approach on the um, judicial side towards um, the risks that we see in the relationship with China, also the difficulties to... And you've been listening there to Ursula von der Leyen, the President of the European Commission, at the end of a key meeting with EU leaders in Brussels.